we're going to take a look at a great story in the scripture today, the story of Samson. I love that story. I remember the first time I, I even heard about the story, it apparently it wasn't in Sunday school. I was sitting uh, in my grandmother's living room, and a movie came on in the middle of the afternoon by, I think the hero was Victor McClure, if I remember, that's who the actor was, who played Samson. And I thought, Grandma, this is a great story. I love this. She said, well, it's in the Bible. I said, you're kidding. <laughs> and she showed me where it was, and I read that story, and I was blessed by it. Praise God. Well, praise God. Well, not all the story of Samson's good news, <laughs> but praise God, the end was. So we're going to take a look at that story. I, You know, I forgot to tell you about Sven and Ollie last week, they had another adventure. They decided to go uh, fishing. Uh, they usually just went to the edge of the lake and went fishing, but they decided they weren't doing so well, so they would rent a boat. So they rented a boat, and they went out in the middle of the lake. No sooner had they thrown the line in than they caught a fish, and then another, and another. And I mean, it was overwhelming. The boat was just filled with fish. And Holly said, Sven, I've never seen so many fish in all my life. I wish we could mark this place so we wouldn't forget where it was. And Sven goes, oh, Holly, we can. I have a chalk in my tackle box. We will just put an X in the middle of this boat to mark this place. And Ollie says, you goofy fella, what if we don't rent the same boat? <laughs> well, somebody else would get that place then, wouldn't they? They'd lose their spot. <sighs> Pray for Sven and Ollie. They really need it. <laughs> they sure have troubles. Well, Judges 16, 28, our text today. This is the prayer of Samson, and it's still a good prayer today. Verse, uh, what am I, verse 28. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once. O oh God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. O oh Lord, remember me. That's still a powerful prayer that God still hears. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this great story of Samson. So many lessons that we learn from this uh, man that once had great power and strength with you, but lost it. And the same thing can happen to us. But thankfully, Lord, you're always there to hear the repentant cry. Oh, God, oh, Lord, remember me. And maybe that's a prayer that someone needs to pray today, maybe here in this auditorium, or somebody that may be listening by Facebook today. The enemy has ensnared them, and all hope seems to be lost. They're struggling today. But if they'll just cry out with that fervent, heartfelt prayer, O oh Lord, remember me, you will, and you will touch them. In Jesus' name, have your way and anointing. I ask it in your name. Amen. Praise God. You know, many people have offered that same plea to God. O oh Lord, remember me. A woman named Hannah. Frustrated and barren was in the temple of God. Her cry to God, Lord, remember me. It wasn't just an ordinary prayer. It was heartfelt, passionate, and fervent. And it moved the heart of God. And it wasn't too much long later, well, maybe nine months, <laughs> the great prophet Samuel was born to this extraordinary woman. Luke, 
gives us details of the great crucifixion of our Lord Jesus. What a drama. On either side of our suffering Savior were the writhing bodies of those who were thieves, paying the death penalty for their crimes. They could feel the dull pain of the nails piercing through their wrists, through the arches of their feet, uh, coupled with that that sharp, biting pain of their tortured lungs that was about to collapse from asphyxiation. You see, they knew enough about crucifixion, these two thieves. They had probably heard about it or see, maybe even witnessed some, but they knew that soon the death squad would come along with big boards and crush their kneecaps so that they would collapse and die. All that one of them could do was curse, utter profanity. But the other offered a prayer that would guarantee him the roll call of eternity. Lord, remember me. And I have a feeling that even the pain of that crucifixion eased some when Jesus turned and said, Today, you will be with me in paradise. What words of hope and comfort, cleansing that he received because of that simple cry, Lord, remember me. But I wonder if there was anyone that prayed that prayer any more sincerely than Samson. He was the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde of the Old Testament. His story was one of riches to rags, from brute to buffoon. Few men had the potential that this great man had. We know that because the angel of the Lord told his mother that, that he would have great strength and he would have a special touch of God upon his life. You see, the reason for his great strength wasn't because he looked like Mr. Universe, like me. Well, wait a minute. No, you know better than that. Why, if he looked muscle-bound, everybody would know the secret of his strength, right? No, the secret of his strength was his covenant relationship with God. It was the Holy Spirit that moved upon him, that excited him, and caused great strength to flow through his body. It was God that gave him that strength, and all his exploits were legendary. Why, on one occasion, he tears a lion apart with his bare hands. Another occasion in battle, he kills 30 Philippines. (laughs) Philistines. (laughs) Sorry about that. I I, I know too many Filipinos. (laughs) But he killed many Philistines, 30 uh, on one occasion. And then on another occasion, a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. There wasn't any rope, any band or bonds that could hold him down. He would just flex, and they would break like wet noodles. On another occasion, he rips off the huge city gates of Gaza, one of the five major cities of the Philistines, hold it off its moorings, put it on his back, laughing all the way as he carries it up the mountain. Why, the Israelites thought he was Superman. They thought he was absolutely perfect. Ah, but we all know that he had a huge flaw in his character. Passion was his undoing. He became a slave to passion unbridled lust destroyed this huge man, this great man, and made mincemeat out of him. It all kind of began when he fell in love with a Philistine lady from Timnah. We don't even have her name. Just know where she came from. I'm not sure if it was love or lust, probably more lust than love. But he married this woman and found his life to be filled with terror and 
torture and murder. And you would think he would learn his lesson from it, but he didn't. Again, he falls to that passion within him once again. Falls to a temptress by the name of Delilah. Oh, the traps that Satan sets. So alluring. So inviting. It looks so good. How could it possibly be bad? Or how could it possibly be wrong? It makes us feel so good. But isn't that how he works? He lures us in with the beauty of the world or the what seems to be the happiness of the world or those things that are so enticing. And then he crushes us. The prodigal son spent his inheritance on riotous living. He had a rip Roaring time. Ah, but when all the money was gone, he could no longer hear the music of the world. The party was over. He found himself in a pig pen. Nothing but pain and suffering, regrets, and overwhelming loneliness. He no longer held the aces. He became the joker. Delilah had one mission in mind. It wasn't to love Samson. It wasn't to make him happy. It wasn't to be his help meet. She had one desire. Crush this man. Destroy him. She had been paid off by the Philistine officials and army. Her mission was destruction. And my friend, I'm here to tell you today, you have such an enemy. It's the devil. It's Satan. And he has one mission in mind, not to make you happy, not to bring you joy. He may tell you that, but his mission is to destroy us. Every one of you. Well, pastor, I'm a good Christian. Doesn't matter. It's still his object. It's still his goal to destroy you. The incessant crying constant begging, the constant questioning of this great man, Samson, finally got to him. Oh, come on, Samson, pretty please. Tell me, you, tell me why you're so strong, Samson. You know how much I love you, Samson. But I have to trust you, you know. I mean, it, 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 if we're really going to have a relationship together, Samson, I've got to have your trust. You can't, you can't just tell me things and not be true. I need to know the true secret. Now, you know I'll keep your secret, Samson, because I love you so much. You know how much I love you, Samson. I've shown my love to you. And she just kept wearing him down. He thought it was funny at first, played a few games with her. Let me tell you, friend, don't play games with the devil. <laughs> You'll always come out the loser. Don't even go down that road. Finally, he was wore down, all he could take. Chains of passion brought him crashing down. Sort of like if you remember that big old blimp of what, in the early 1900s, the Hindenburg that blew up and that came crashing to the ground. That was Samson. And it makes you want to cry out to him, Samson, don't you realize what God has done for you? God created you for glory. God designed you for honor and victory. Why, even an angel came and heralded your birth, Samson, like he would one day come and herald the birth of the greatest Savior the world would ever know. Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. But something happened to you, Samson. You fell apart. Like a badly wired Titan missile exploding on the, on the launching pad. Samson, you never achieved the greatness, the destiny God had for you. Oh, what a tragedy. What a tragic story. Before you knew it, he was pinned to the ground. The last thing that his eyes saw were the 
points of swords piercing through one eye and then through the other. The cries, the screams must have been chilling. Can you see? Can you picture that? He realized for the first time the return Satan brings upon him, uh, gives with his promises. Satan blinded him. And that's exactly what he does with each and every one of us if he can. He wants to blind us. He wants to blind us to sin and the results of sin, the path that sin takes us down. Satan is a genius at it. Those intoxicated eyes can only see the beauty of that amber liquid in that bottle. Ah, oh, but they don't see that vehicle crashed beside the road and bodies dead along the way. He doesn't show you the broken homes, the marriages, the loss of money, the loss of position and job, as well as integrity. He doesn't show you those things. Old sin's cataracts may allow you to see that innocent flirtation, that voluptuous form, those bidding eyes, that touch like fire, but he doesn't let you see the broken home that comes with it. That's how Satan works. Satan will allow us to see cars and homes and money and bank accounts and power and prestige. All things, by the way, that are going to melt away one day with fervent heat when God says, that's enough. Satan's not going to let you see the gates of pearl and the streets of gold or the crowns shimmering upon the heads of the faithful. He's not going to let you hear the anthems of the redeemed as they usher in the eternity with a crescendo of holy sound. He doesn't want you to hear or see any of that. Sin blinds. And maybe it's blinding someone today that is listening to this message, either here in this auditorium or is listening by Facebook today, or will listen later. Sin blinds, but it doesn't stop there. The next thing, they grabbed Samson, and they bound him with fetters of brass so tightly that the blood rushed to his extremities, his feet, fingers, numbing pain. Samson would never know freedom ever again. Sin blinds and sin binds. Oh, but those of us, those of us who know Jesus, know true freedom, don't we? For whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Oh, hallelujah. And those aren't just words. Read the stories of Paul and his writings in the epistles. He talks over and over again about the liberty that we have in Jesus Christ. Sin doesn't give you such a luxury. There is no such freedom. In, fa in fact, I don't believe there are chains that bind any more tightly than those chains that are in the Bastille of sin. Evil chains that bind us so tightly we can't seem to break through. In fact, the only hope we have is Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can break those chains, those fetters, and he can and he will. Many of us, maybe all of us, can testify of that fact. He broke those chains. David said this, before knowing Jesus, we were a captive. He said in Psalms 51, 3 and 5, I was conceived in sin and shapen in iniquity. My transgressions were ever before me. Those twin guards of memory and remorse constantly remind me of my guilt. Remind me of the price, the penalty that I will pay for my sin. But Jesus changed all of that. Hallelujah. Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, 
There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit is life in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free. We're free. But sin binds. Samson is now brought down deep in the dungeon beneath the temple of Dagon, Dagon, a fish god. Can you imagine? Worshiping a fish god. That's how low Satan will take people. Listen, you may not worship a fish god, but some people worship other people. Or they'll worship that bottle they can't get away from. Or they'll worship other things that have them tied and bound. Beneath that dungeon, Samson is ordered to begin grinding at the meal, at the, at the mill. Grinding food for his enemy. Sin blinds. Sin binds. And sin grinds. It'll grind you down. It was feast day in, in Gaza. And 3,000 Philistines came to celebrate the feast god. Oh, my. And they probably, knowing the history of how those heathen cultures worshipped, they got in a drunken stupor and began to cry out, Bring us Samson! I can almost hear the cry. Sounds somewhat familiar. Samson! 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 Well, they, weren't, they didn't want him to come out so they could applaud him and cheer him and say, What a wonderful guy. They wanted to mock him, to cheer him, to laugh at him. So Samson's brought out. And part of the mockery was he was led by a little child. Because Samson's blind. He can't see. So a little child's bringing him out. And the laughter becomes even more. They start throwing objects at him, hitting his body, adding to the misery and pain once again. Think about it. That's what Satan wants to do to you, my friend. Derision and laughter filled the whole crowd. This great legend was now a loser. Ah, but something had happened. In the meantime, Samson's hair began to grow. Now, let me make something really clear here. It wasn't his hair that made him strong. If it was, I would grow hair all over the place if I could. But that isn't it. It was only a symbol of his covenant relationship with God. And when he violated his covenant, which was never to cut his hair, he broke his covenant with God. And his, re, uh, his uh, walk with God was marred by that sin, by that rebellion. But I have a feeling in the meantime, grinding at the mill, being beaten, tortured, he had a lot of time to think and a lot of time to pray and he began to reconnect with his God. And his sign of his covenant began to return. But they didn't notice any of that. Probably never even crossed their mind for that matter. They thought they had him where they wanted him. And so when they finally got tired of playing games with Samson, they moved him off to the side somewhere so they could continue their other activities, whatever it might be. Samson is led over between two pillars. And there in that place, 
he touches God once again. In that strange little prayer room, if you could call it that, a fervent, powerful prayer begins to well up inside of him. Again, our text, Judges 16, 28, O Lord God, remember me. I pray thee and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines from my two eyes. Can God possibly hear the prayer of this ravaged man? Could God possibly answer a prayer of a man who so carelessly threw away his life? Can God hear a holy prayer from such an unholy place? Oh, thank God, yes. And Samson reaches for a pillar. Maybe he has that little boy say, hey, put my hand on this pillar. And he finds the pillar. And he prays, oh, Lord, God, remember me. He kind of puts his arm around it, puts his shoulder into it. And his prayer continues, strengthen me, oh, God, one more time. And somewhere deep within this ravaged man, a fountainhead of divine spirit began to flow. It manifested itself in his muscles and sinews. Strength began to flow again in his arms and in his legs. And he began to talk or push. The crowd couldn't hear it. They were so drunk, so out of their minds, so caught up in their worship of their crazy fish god. But Samson could hear it, the groaning, the creaking as that pillar began to form a crack along the base. And then he gave that final little nudge, and that pillar fell, hit the other pillar next to him, and it began to crash it down. The, the roof of the place began to shake, and it began to fall down upon the people. Dust was flying everywhere, and the cries of the dying, Samson became a hero one more time, a deliverer of God's people, and a servant of the Most High God. But oh, what a price he had to pay. His prayer was simple. Oh, Lord, remember me. It was a prayer that Hannah would pray a few short years later. Prophets would pray it. Kings would pray it. A dying thief would pray it from a cross. And every time God heard such a passionate, fervent, honest, sincere prayer, Lord, remember me. And church, he still hears it today. He still hears that cry today. And he still responds. I believe somebody, somebody today is listening to this message somewhere. It may be on the other side of the world they hear this message. And God touches their heart because that's them. They need such a prayer. They need such a hope because they have been blinded by sin. Sin has bound them so tightly there seems to be no escape. And life has become a grind. Their whole life is devastated by the clutches of sin. They feel like there's no hope, no answer. And they protest today, oh, it's too late for me. I've done too much. I've sinned too much. I, I violated God's plan for me. He would never take me back, not the way I am. No, not the way you are, but he will change you. Because he says, I've come in John 10, 10, that you might have life and that more abundantly. The devil doesn't offer you abundant life. He gives you death and destruction. The Bible says, whosoever will may come. 
God said he's not willing that any perish, but all come to repentance. God says in John 3, 16, that he so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That means you. That means every one of us. It's for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He can change you today when you offer that simple, heartfelt cry. Lord, I'm not worthy, but would you remember me? And he will. He will. Church, he will respond today. Would you offer that cry to God? If you need that cry today, offer that to him. And he will hear it. Many of us here in this auditorium today could say, I've already offered that prayer a long time ago, and he heard me. He cleansed me of my sin. I was going down a path of destruction. Some of you could testify, man, you were lost. <laughs> you were actually on the verge of death. I've heard a few of your testimonies. I know that's true. But God heard your cry, and he saved you. He redeemed you, and he's got you on a right path. Hallelujah of great victory. And he will do that for anybody here or anybody listening today. No matter where you are, no matter what you've done, God hears that cry. Lord, remember me. Can we bow our heads, please?